The world in which we live is a mess. The world around us does not see Christ as we do. Does not love the Lord Jesus Christ as we do. And because of that fundamental flaw, the world around us is careening into every kind of self-made disaster. Seeking for things like hope and satisfaction and happiness in things that will never satisfy. Making up rules for itself and, and with some sort of religious fervor, trying to compel everyone else to go down its disastrous path. And what would we expect? For apart from Christ, who of us could orient his life in a way that actually brings ultimate joy, ultimate satisfaction, real freedom? Any of these things that only come by a right relationship to your maker. We ought not be surprised that the world around us is falling apart. I'm convinced this morning that we need to look inward a bit. The Apostle Peter wrote in 1 Peter 4, 17, it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if the church is the pillar and support of the truth, then how well the world will see Jesus in great measure depends on our love for Jesus, our fidelity to Christ, What we have in the next section of our study of the book of Revelation is a series of audits of churches. Seven letters from Jesus to seven churches in the first century who had some things going for them and some problems. The investigation of these letters will be an investigation of our own hearts, an investigation of this church, I don't know if you've ever been audited, placed under the microscope of the Internal Revenue Service or some auditing firm, maybe an internal audit in your company. What would it be like for a church to be audited, to be measured up against the standards of the Lord of the church, Jesus Christ? Not a financial audit, not an inspection of the books or the budgets, the payroll or some regulatory compliance, but but spiritually to be audited, to get a rundown on how things are going for you individually at the heart level, or to get a spiritual rundown on how things are going in the church. Things spiritual, things theological, things devotional to come under the scrutiny of the one who knows intimately the ins and outs of your church and your life. That's what these seven letters in Revelation 2 and Revelation 3 are. Again, we have the the picture, the geography on a slide here so we can get our bearings. These churches are located in what is modern day Turkey or Asia Minor. Maybe we don't. Don't worry about it. They're there. We'll see them in the coming slot in the coming weeks. We got them. Okay. I don't know if that's the one I was looking for. That's all right. Uh, that is the zoom in map on uh, what is modern day Turkey or Asia Minor. Uh, above that and to the left, that there you go. So above that and to the left, you have Europe. Off to the right, you have Asia. Down to the bottom, you have Africa. Kind of in the middle. Down on the right, you have Jerusalem, and then John is on that little rock in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, just off the coast of the Red Circle. He's imprisoned on the island of Patmos, and and he's looking across the sea back, and you can go to the next slide now, at, at this piece of land where there were seven churches, and these seven churches, the first of which is Ephesus. They, they were arranged in a postal route, a circular road, that when mail went to this province or trade or commerce went into this province and when the gospel went into this province, it sort of traveled to these seven major cities and then outward. And John in prison, looking across the sea from his prison home, back at that land, back at that territory where the people he loved were, where the churches that he pastored still were, and is commissioned by Jesus to give these letters. 
When we think about these letters, they, they are for the seven churches described. The first one that we're looking at this morning is to the church at Ephesus. And yet if you look down at, at Revelation 2.7, we have this statement, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The conclusion of the letter to Ephesus from Jesus through John concludes with this invitation for anybody who can hear. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So each one of these letters, while addressing an individual localized congregation, was to be absorbed and taken in by all seven of those churches and then to be heeded by anyone who can hear these words. These are no doubt for us. The kinds of difficulties and temptations that these seven churches encountered are the kinds of challenges that churches in every age have encountered. And the threats to the churches in Asia are the kinds of threats that individual Christians face. So these seven letters serve as a gut check for churches, a heart check for individual Christians. Let's read together the first of these, this letter to the church at Ephesus. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands says this, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance and that you cannot tolerate evil men and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles and they are not and you found them to be false and you have perseverance and you have endured for my namesake and have not grown weary. But... I have this against you. You have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Yet this you do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. We might refer to this section of Revelation as Second Ephesians. It's not the second letter of Paul to the Ephesians. But this is a significant letter, and this one comes directly from the Lord Jesus. In the church at Ephesus, we have the opportunity to see the life of a church over a couple of generations. What does it look like to see a church birthed and have new believers and then to be cared for and to grow in its discernment, in its doctrine, in its maturity, and then to see another generation later? How is it doing? We get to see here Jesus' personal assessment of that church. And we know quite a bit about the church at Ephesus. There were prominent founding members of this church. Priscilla and Aquila were evangelists and disciplers. Apollos was there, strong in the scriptures. Paul, in his third missionary journey, stayed nearly three years at Ephesus, preaching and teaching, shepherding. And then Timothy was there as a pastor, first in 65 AD and then for another stint, 67 to 68 AD. Ephesus also enjoyed the company of uh, Onesiphorus, of Tuchicus, and then by 66 AD, the Apostle John himself pastored there probably for decades. We learn in Acts 19 and 20 that the church was birthed under persecution. When the gospel came, uh, the gospel encountered demonic resistance. The seven sons of Sceva antagonized gospel preaching. And then you had the gospel so prolific making such an impact in the city that Demetrius the silversmith started a riotous mob to try to put a stop to the gospel. Why was Demetrius, a, a blue-collar laborer, concerned about gospel progress? Because he made idols. He, he fashioned little deities out of silver. And if people started believing the gospel, they would turn to Jesus from idolatry and they wouldn't buy his stuff anymore. It was purely economics. We learn from the letter to the Ephesians, in the first three chapters, we see that they were established in sound doctrine. 
In chapter four of Ephesians, we learned that, that they were discerning. They, they were not to be tossed around by every wind of doctrine, every new idea that blew through town, but they were to grow up in their maturity and their discernment of truth and error. Chapter four, verse 17 tells us they were to walk differently than the world around them. And then in Ephesians five, uh, we get these statements. Look down at Ephesians five, and verse six. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these empty words, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. These were empty words that would lead the Ephesian believers to things like immorality and impurity and coarse jesting and silly talk things that incur, incur the wrath of God. We find in verse 11, the command, do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. We get another letter to the Ephesian church effectively through Timothy who was pastoring there. First Timothy and second Timothy were both written to Paul's protege. And we have this instruction in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. The goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and sincere faith. But some men straying from these things turn aside to fruitless discussion. They want to be teachers even though they do not understand what they're saying. These are warnings against false teaching. Look down at verse 18. Paul says, Timothy, I entrust these things to you in accordance with the prophecies previously made, that you fight the good fight, keep faith in a good conscience, which some reject and suffer shipwreck in regard to their faith. In 2 Timothy 4, 3, we get this warning. Time will come when men will not endure sound doctrine. They will want to have their ears tickled. They will accumulate for themselves teachers according to their own desires, and they will turn away their ears from the truth. The church at Ephesus was richly endowed with sound doctrine and with warnings against falling away from the truth, encouragements to be discerning. All of these things were in place and, and we have the opportunity in Revelation chapter two some 30 years later to see how did the church do. We will look this morning at Jesus' evaluation of the church at Ephesus in six elements. The first of these six elements is the salutation. We get this in verse one. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, says Jesus, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this. Here is the greeting, the, the opening salutation of Jesus' letter. The church at Ephesus gets this letter some 35 years after Paul wrote Ephesians. And by that time, it had become the centerpiece of evangelism in Asia Minor, this Roman province. And the first city you would come to in Asia was Ephesus. All Roman officials were actually required to stop there first. It was the center of commerce and trade. It was the center of games in the area. They had a 25,000 seat stadium. Ephesus was a seaport and was on four different trade routes and therefore became the marketplace of Asia. It was a cosmopolitan city with a lot of different kinds of people in it. And the center of life in Ephesus was the temple of Diana or Artemis. She was said to be the goddess of fertility and eroticism. To worship Diana meant worship by cult prostitution, uh, an immoral kind of idolatry. In fact, immorality in the city was world-renowned. There were also two temples in the city dedicated to the imperial cult. The emperor by that time had established a religion centered around himself and you had to burn incense and pay homage to the emperor, eventually in order even to do trade in the city. And as Jesus addresses these seven church, he begins each of the letters with a salutation, and the salutation begins with a throwback to chapter one. Do you remember that vision of Christ that we saw in chapter one, this glorious, exalted Christ? 
And we get a, a throwback to that vision here in the opening line of the letter to Ephesus. Look back at chapter one. You remember this scene. It is Christ, verse 13, in the middle of the lampstands, clothed in a robe reaching to the feet, girded across the chest with a golden sash, his head and his hair white like white wool, like snow, his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. John says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. We get the description in verse 20 of the seven stars. Jesus explains, the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the lampstands are the seven churches. And when we come to the letter to Ephesus, we get this introduction. The one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands. This is a dramatic picture. We are to, we are to put ourselves in John's feet Imagining ourselves before the glorified, resurrected Christ and, and falling down as dead in all of his greatness. And then to contemplate Jesus' comforting touch and comforting words to the Apostle John. And then to see the Lord Jesus holding the stars in his hand. The supernatural reality behind what we do as a church. And walking amongst the lampstands. What is this picture. It is that Jesus cares about what goes on in church. Jesus is sovereign. He's in possession of the churches. He holds the stars in his hands and he is present among the churches. He inspects them. He knows what goes on in his churches. He knows what takes place there. As we'll find out in this letter, Jesus has the ability to remove a lampstand from its place. He is present, he is sovereign, and he is concerned in and among his churches. And when Jesus says the churches are the lampstand, this imagery is important. The purpose of a lampstand is not to shine light. The lampstand holds the light that shines. The lampstand is the platform on which the lamp resides. Jesus himself is the light. His truth is a light. His gospel is the light that the world needs. And a church is designed by Jesus to be the platform for that light. As the sovereign shepherd over his churches, Jesus knows what goes on in his churches and he has the power and the concern to remove them as effective lampstands. That leads us to the second element of this letter. It is Jesus' commendation. This is found in verses 2 and 3 and then in verse 6. Jesus says, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance, that you cannot tolerate evil men. You put to the test those who call themselves apostles and they're not, and you found them to be false. You have perseverance and you have endured for my name's sake. You have not grown weary and you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Now think about those first words, I know, says Jesus. I know your deeds, I know your toil, I know your perseverance. Whatever you're going through as a Christian, whatever a church may be going through in its given era, what a comfort it is to hear that Jesus knows. Jesus is aware and he cares and he's present. Whatever you are suffering, Christian, it is not lost on Christ. He is present and he knows. All the toil, all the trouble, he says, I know your deeds, that is your life and your conduct in keeping with Christ's likeness. If you are giving in secret, praying in secret, fasting in secret, your Father in heaven sees these things and great is your reward. Jesus says, I know your toil. This is a word for all out effort to the point of exhaustion. And he says, I know your perseverance. That is the courageous acceptance of hardship and suffering and loss. The Ephesian ability to bear up under difficulty. 
And then notice Jesus praises them for their intolerance. That sounds strange on 21st century ears, doesn't it? He says, you did not tolerate, and this is a good thing, you did not tolerate evil men. That is, they had an ongoing ability to turn away false teachers. They were unable to bear with those who brought in impurity in the church, either by behavior or by teaching. He says, you cannot tolerate evil men. You, you put to the test those who call themselves apostles and they're not. Someone infiltrating the church and, and claiming some sort of authority for Jesus and teaching things Jesus didn't want. It would not be a matter of love to allow those things to continue. And Jesus commends the church at Ephesus for doing what is right. The church had experienced trouble on the outside the seven sons of Sceva, Demetrius, the angry mob in Acts 19. They experienced the pressure of the Artemis cult. The, the, the temple of Diana was the prominent structure in the city. It, it was the place that people wanted to build their houses, new property values were much higher the closer you got to Diana's temple. They also felt the pressure from the emperor cult. They felt pressure as well in this city from the Jews. There was a significant Jewish population in Ephesus at the time, and Christians by that time were being rejected out of Judaism for their belief that Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. And then they had nowhere to go. They had no safe space under the Roman protection of the Jewish religion. And so they were out on their own, orphaned. And then there was the pressure from the Nicolaitans, Verse six, Jesus says, you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. The, the Nicolaitan presence was there at Ephesus and the church at Ephesus had rejected it. They experienced trouble on the inside. The false apostles were the deluded, self-deceived deceivers. They weren't claiming to destroy Christianity but to offer a new version of it. They sought to corrupt it from the inside they were posers, they were wolves, they were false teachers. People claiming Jesus' authority while teaching another way. It's interesting that they rejected the Nicolaitans. It, it's believed that the Nicolaitan following came from Nicholas, one of those uh, early servants in the church from Acts 6. It seems that he strayed in his living and strayed in his doctrine and got a following. The Nicolaitan belief was the idea that, hey, you can have Ephesian-style Diana cult immorality and still follow Jesus. You can pursue sexual immorality as a course of life and still be a faithful disciple of Jesus. He wanted to live in both worlds. His life had gone astray. He maintained a role as a teacher and got a following of people after him. The Ephesian church says we're not doing that. So Jesus praised them for their endurance and their perseverance, verse 3, for his namesake. It's a paradoxical commendation that Jesus gives. You've toiled to the point of weariness, and yet you are not weary. You're enduring and you're persevering. And all for my name's sake, says Jesus. What was their motivation? The glory of Christ, the honor of Christ. The Ephesian church had practical holiness and theological discernment. They were uncomfortable with compromise. They suffered for the name of Jesus. They were exhausted in their loyalty to Christ, but they were not exhausted of their loyalty to Christ. They were a mature, established, tested, and seasoned body of Christians. But verse four, we come to the next element of Jesus' address. It is a confrontation. This is the scary part of the audit. Jesus says, but I have this against you. You have left your first love. Now, the word for left here is a sad departure. It's the word used for divorce, the ripping apart of relationship. It is abandonment. This is a definite and sad departure from something. From, from what? From what Jesus calls your first love. Is this love for God? Is this love for fellow believers? Is this love for the lost? What, what does he have in mind here? 
Jesus refers to a first love. It's certainly true that Christians should prioritize love for Christ, but I believe here that Jesus is talking about the love they had at the first, the the honeymoon days of the church. And this would have involved all three dimensions of love, the love for God, love for fellow believers, and love for outsiders. The, The first one, of course, is the priority and the greatest command, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. And love for God comes from God's love for us. We did not love him first. We love him in return for his love for us. But out of that love for God by believers flows a love for fellow believers. And Jesus himself said that he came to seek and to save the lost. So our love for Jesus and and the love of God flowing out of us means we will be drawn to love what he loves. He loves his bride, the church. And he came to seek and save that which was lost. To say that we love God but we don't love our brother is to be deceived about our love for God. And if you love Jesus, you'll be drawn to love your neighbor. Jesus defined in the parable of the Good Samaritan that our neighbor is pretty much everybody. Love for the brother and love for others flow out of love for Christ. And so if you notice love in your own heart waxing cold, it is an indication that your love for Christ has gone cold. If you love Christ supremely, you will love his bride. If you love Christ supremely, you'll not be able to help telling others about him. The best evangelists, by the way, are not those who have worked out all the arguments. The best evangelists are those who just love Christ. I can't believe that he loves me. Can I tell you about it? And what does Jesus say about his church at Ephesus? He says their love for Christ has gone cold. How does this happen? In the words of Pastor Todd Dykstra, this happens when the Savior is replaced with a system, a relationship is replaced with a routine, and the Master is replaced by ministry. It is a loss of love and joy of fellowship with God personally. Turn to John chapter 14. On the last night that Jesus was with his disciples, he he spoke much about love, and I want you to see the relationship between love and obedience and fellowship. John 14, 21. He who has my commandments, Jesus says, and keeps them is the one who loves me. You can't say, I love Jesus, but I don't want to do anything he says. And he who loves me will be, listen to this, loved by my Father, and I will love him, and I will disclose myself to him. You want a relational experience with God? You want a relational closeness with Christ? Then draw near to him in affectionate love that manifests in obedience. The one who loves Jesus will be loved by the Father and loved by Jesus, and Jesus will disclose himself to you. Look down at verse 23. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. Something is missing here in the Ephesian church. This relational, intimate, fellowship, love with Christ has grown old and has gotten cold. The Ephesian church was guilty of doing lots of work on the lampstand. The lampstand is the church, the platform, without paying attention to the light for which the lampstand exists. How good is a lampstand with no lamp? We could all compliment one another. Hey, that's a really nice lampstand you have over there. I love the way it's constructed. It's it's built really, really nicely. It's it's polished, it's it's shiny. But where's the lamp? Where's the light for which it exists? A, A lampstand with no light is merely a paperweight. 
You see, doctrinal purity, theological fidelity, suffering under persecution, all of these are supposed to be a platform for the light of Christ to shine. They themselves are not the light. Your doctrinal fidelity is not the light. The programs and the systems and the ministries are not the light. Turning away error is not by itself the light. All of those things exist to be a platform for the light of the life of the gospel. The light and the beauty radiating from Jesus Christ and his truth. Jesus is the light. Our love for him can grow dim while we are busy doing things for him. And then the doing things for him doesn't last long in that state. Practical holiness, theological discernment, intolerance for compromise, heresy hunting, these things are not designed to be the long-lasting fuel for the church. What is the fuel for the church? Fervent, personal love of God through Jesus Christ. So the next element in Jesus' letter is a command, verse 5. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen. Repent and do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Jesus gives these rapid fire commands remember, repent, and return. Remember. This is a a present tense command in in an ongoing way. Remember this now and and keep on remembering. Never Never let it get out of your mind. Keep on remembering what? Notice what he says. Remember from where you have fallen. What does he mean by that? Remember back to the love you had at the first. Remember back to your first love. You have slipped. You have fallen away from it. Remember it. Put it in your mind and and keep it there in an ongoing way. Walk it back. Walk it back in your heart to to the point where there were divergent paths. Can you look back and see where did my personal devotional love for Christ start to slip? Retrace that path. Go back to where those paths diverged. Walk it back to that honeymoon phase of your love for Christ. And he says, repent. This command is is more of an immediate, deliberate, decisive change required. A a change of attitude resulting in a change of action. A a 180 degree about face. It's a change of mind resulting in a changed trajectory of life. He says, remember, repent, and return. Again, this this command is a go back to where you were. Do it now. Go back to the things you used to do when love for me was at the center. Do you remember it, Ephesus? And I would say to you this morning, Christian, do, do you remember when you loved Christ so well? Do you remember what it was like to be saved? To to have been an enemy of God? That God over and over again showered kindness and, and generous gifts to you while you spurned him. And then one day you realized you were a sinner. At odds with your maker. That you were the problem from the heart. That you were acting out of your nature. And you needed a fundamental rescue. You couldn't clean yourself up. You couldn't fix the problem. You couldn't outdo with good things the things you'd already done with bad things. You needed a rescue. And God in his kindness and his mercy brought you to his son the one who went to the cross to purchase that rescue. And when Jesus went to the cross, he bore all your sins there and carried them far away so they could never be addressed again, forgave them, washed them out, made that which is filthy white as snow, that which was guilty blood red, snow white, all of grace, Nothing you could do. A flat out rescue. Do you remember it? 
Do you remember what it was like to be so amazed and so grateful? It doesn't matter whatever else I get in this life. If I get nothing else good from the Lord, I have my sins forgiven and heaven is my home. Bring on trials, bring on troubles. I'll give up anything to have Christ. What did that look like at Ephesus? Well, they went into the city square and took out all their magic books and burned them. Old life, up in smoke. I don't care. I want Christ. What has happened? The Ephesian church had allowed the fruits of love for Christ to replace love for Christ. You see, doctrinal fidelity, theological discernment, moral rectitude, uncompromising loyalty, all of these things came out of their love for Christ. They loved Christ, therefore we want the truth, we will not be tolerant of error. But the blazing center of the Christian life was eventually set aside by the fruits of that blazing center. And it's easy to see how that could happen. The church was birthed with, by the gospel and everything was new. Brand new believers who love Christ. It was 50,000 days wages worth of their own possessions that they burned in the city square. They gladly faced rejection and persecution by the Jewish community, by the Ephesian neighbors, and they were isolated. And what begins to happen when, when faithful Christians start to feel isolated by pressure on the outside? The, the outside trouble promotes protectionism. And if there was inside trouble, false apostles, Nicolaitans, that would breed skepticism and suspicion. Hey, are you one of those false teachers infiltrating the church? Pretty soon, everyone is looking over their shoulder for someone who's going to compromise morally, someone who's going to teach something that's just a little off theologically, and it's not long before the church prides itself in its theological purity and its moral integrity, its ability to discern, while the central thing, love for Christ, secretly exits out the side door. That central thing is the thing that makes the church the church. It's the reason the lampstand exists, the fire and the light of Christ, and it's no longer shining. And a generation goes by, and now the church at Ephesus is in danger of going out of existence. And oh yes, the machinery of the church is still operating. The doors open on Sundays, sermons are preached, songs are sung, error is pointed out, sin is exposed, compromisers are run out of town, but the defining characteristic of the church, the defining characteristic of a Christian, is gone. Love has left the building. And this is no mere trifle, this is a fatal flaw. How do you recover How do you remember, repent, and return? It it really is just the basics of the Christian life. What does it mean to walk with Christ? What does it mean to love Jesus? It, It means to read your Bible. It means for you to read your Bible. To to open up God's word and to meet with him to allow God's word to shine in your heart, to to give you timely encouragement, to give you timely conviction. It means that you open your Bible to know him. That's the fundamental definition of eternal life, John 17, 3. To know him and the one he has sent. It is possible, of course, to own a Bible. It's possible to get biblical data secondhand. That's a wholly different thing than loving God's word and opening it for yourself and treating it like daily bread. I need this to survive. And it is possible to open your own Bible and read your own Bible every day to settle disputes, to get information, to even puff up pride with increasing knowledge. But it's a wholly different thing to open your Bible like Isaiah came into the throne room in Isaiah 6. 
to, to read the words on these pages as though God himself were in your presence speaking. That's what this is. How often, Christian, do you read your Bible with your eyes down and your heart down on a horizontal plane? How often do we talk with each other about theological things merely at a horizontal level? That we must read our Bibles with our hearts up and talk with each other with our hearts up. To engage with God as we engage with his words. Not to miss him. To walk the basics of the Christian life, to reinvigorate love for Christ, also means to pray. To pray. Prayer ought to be like breathing to the Christian. In, out. Inhale, exhale. Take in God's word. Exhale out prayer. We ought to plan to pray, intentionally pray, set aside time to pray, and we ought to continuously pray. Pray without ceasing. Keith Green wrote the song, Make My Life a Prayer to You. I love that sentiment. A continual living before the Lord as if I'm in his very presence all the time because Christian, you are. To speak before him as if you're in his presence all the time. As if he can hear every word that you're saying. Because he is and he can. And to speak to him readily, easily, often. I think the basic language of the Christian heart ought to be the simple word help. The expression of dependence. Dear Lord, I'm about to make this decision. Help. I'm about to walk into this conversation. Help me. We have examples of prayer in the Bible where a puny little follower of God is before a mighty ruler and he's praying while he speaks. This ought to be the Christian life. Regular activity and life in the presence of God. How much Christian activity do we do apart from that? Read your Bible, pray. Uh, let me give you another way to repent. Remember, repent, and return. Stay on short accounts with sin. You recognize a wayward trajectory in your heart and an attitude that's off. Go to the Lord quickly. Recognize it. Confess it. God's, God saw it. You see it. Agree with him. Look again at the cross of Christ. Rejoice in forgiveness purchased by his blood and repent. Turn from sin. Put off that which displeases the Lord. Put on that which pleases him. How do we remember, repent, and return? Think about your relationships, Christian. This affects every relationship. You think about relationships with believers. How do you bring Christ into every relationship? Well, I think you want to seek out the kinds of brothers and sisters in Christ who help you love Christ more. You ought to prioritize the kinds of friendships that make you love Jesus. And you ought to be the kind of brother or sister in Christ who causes others to love Christ more. And think about your relationships with unbelievers. Take Christ into every relationship. Your relationship to Christ defines you more than anything else that could define you. More than the clothing you wear, the color of your skin, the background of, of your family, the, the language that you speak, the food that you eat, the music that you listen to, all of those things are superficial. Christ defines you. And he ought to define your relationship to everyone you meet. Are you living an eyes down Christian life? 
busy with the world, distracted, distracted with good things, neutral things, or even bad things. We ought to live a heart up Christian life. In the words of Colossians 1.18, Christ is to have first place in everything. Not that you have your Jesus time in the morning and you go about your business, but Jesus being Lord of every aspect of your life. This is a call to go back to honeymoon Christianity. You know, it's easy to talk about the things that you love. You're a fanatic about a sports team. It's easy to broadcast that, even in a hostile town. When you were newly married, it's easy to just bubble over with joy about how great it is to be married to this greatest person in the history of the universe. And she still is. If we love Christ first and most, that ought to just bubble up in hostile territory and otherwise. If Christ isn't first in your mind and first out of your lips, bubbling over from your heart, I would suggest we have some work to do at cultivating love. It takes work. Absence does not make the heart grow fonder. You can't depart from daily discipline, a pursuit of Christ, and expect that he will grow larger in your affections. That doesn't work that way. And so there is discipline in this, intentional effort to abide in him so that your love will not grow cold. Listen to the way Jesus recommends this in John 15. Verse 9, Jesus says, Just as the Father has loved me, I also loved you. What a staggering thought that is. Command, abide in my love. Abide means to remain, to dwell, to, to take up your residence in. Just go live there. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I kept my Father's commandments and I abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be full. Christian, you already know this. You're, you're not going to have joy apart from abiding in Christ as much as you might be tempted to seek it in other things. And if you're not in Christ and you're here this morning and you're hearing my words, you need to know beyond a shadow of a doubt there is zero hope for real joy apart from Christ. But this promise is so rich. Abide in me. Dwell there. Live there. Live in the love of God through Christ. It must be cultivated. Notice Jesus' warning in verse 5 of Revelation 2. Or else... Or else I am coming to you and I will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. This is not a reference to Jesus' final return. This is a reference to Jesus' sovereign shepherding care of his churches. He walks among the lampstands. He moves lampstands out of their places. This is Jesus' care for churches in time. If if love is gone, a church doesn't get to remain a faithful witness to the truth. These things are to go hand in hand. It means that a church cannot survive on merely the operation of its machinery, its programs, its systems. It can't survive merely on doctrinal adherence. It cannot survive on what it is against. Listen, churches must be against things that Christ is against. The next letters make it plain that Christ will not tolerate churches that tolerate dangerous error. Churches that tolerate the infiltration of immorality. Christ is against those things. But a church cannot survive merely on its fight against error. That is not what defines a church. The church must be characterized by, defined by, and driven by love. Biblical love. Love by God's definition for the honor and glory of God. Love for God is the highest priority flowing out in love for others. Love is to be the lifeblood of the church. And if it is not, then the church at Ephesus can no longer exist. To be useful to Christ as a lampstand, you must be inflamed with love for Christ, or you will be removed from that usefulness. 
All of this is followed by the plea in verse 7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In CB radio jargon, you got your ears on? Are you on the frequency? Are you hearing what I'm broadcasting, says Jesus. This is a refrain Jesus used in the parables. He uses in all of these letters to the churches. This is a gracious invitation from the Lord Jesus. And those who are born of the Spirit, those who belong to him, those who are on his frequency will hear and heed what he has to say. Christian, are you hearing Jesus' words this morning? This is designed to awaken the conscience of the faithful amidst the compromise of others, and it has universal application to all churches. He who has an ear, let him hear. And the letter concludes with a promise, second half of verse seven, to the one who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. To the one who overcomes, uh, we get our uh, American brand name Nike from the verb here. To overcome, to conquer, to be victorious. An overcomer, according to 1 John 5, is a true believer in Jesus Christ. And and what is promised to the true believers, those who overcome? Jesus says, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And and you should be thinking of Genesis. In the Garden of Eden, the the tree of life, the, the promise of everlasting life. And you should be thinking about Revelation 21 and 22, where the tree of life shows up in the eternal state. It, it bears its leaves in its seasons and its fruit for eating in each of its seasons. And when you hear the word paradise, you, you should be thinking about Jesus saying to the, the, the thief on, hanging on a cross next to him who believed, today you will be with me in paradise. Uh, No doubt these images come to mind. Eternal life in in the paradise of God with access to the tree of life. All of these are held out as promises to overcomers. Uh, There's something else here in the imagery Jesus uses. And it goes back to the the temple of Diana there in the middle of the city. The, The Diana cult and its temples were successively built on an ancient sacred shrine, a a tree shrine. In fact, if you look at the coinage from Ephesus from this time, uh, they have this great giant tree as a symbol of the city, as an emblem of the Diana cult. In other words, their, their culture, their immorality, their worship of a false god, all intertwined around the same thing as what made Ephesus as a city, Ephesus. And the word paradise is an old Persian word. The Persians used to control this area. And so in Ephesus, this idea of paradise was bound up with the cult of Diana. In the very temple of Diana uh, was uh, this tree that was the center of worship of her. She was a goddess of fertility and reproduction and sexuality. and, And the worship of Diana was done with gross immorality. And what's promised there is what? Paradise in this little enclave. Eternal life to be found in this sexualized idolatry. And Jesus says as a direct contrast to life at Ephesus, no, you believe in me, you overcome, be faithful to me, I will give you the true paradise and what is truly eternal life. And it's interesting, the the city at Ephesus was was plagued. They had built Ephesus as a port city with access to the sea. But the river kept bringing silt down and filled the harbor such that by the time of the New Testament, Ephesus was some two and a half miles away from the sea. And in successive centuries, people had tried to dredge the channel and keep the city closer, but they kept actually having to move the city. And when Jesus says to the church at Ephesus, I will move your lampstand, the the word there is where we get our English word kinetic for movement. The city of Ephesus kept having to move and Jesus said, if you're not faithful to maintain fervent love for me, your lampstand will be moved. For Ephesian readers of this letter, this would have been dramatic. Yeah, our, our city is unstable, it's always moving. And the Diana cult and the tree of life and paradise, wait, Jesus Be faithful. And here, faithfulness from Jesus' correction to this church. 
is the faithfulness to cultivate love for Christ from the heart. How did the church respond? I can't get there yet. There's, <laughs> there, there's one more thing about the, the temple of Diana. The temple of Diana was considered an unassailable refuge for unrepentant criminals. Specifically, it was written, if you were a thief or a robber or a man-stealer, that's the old Greek word for the stealing people and selling them into slavery. The, the worst criminals in the world, if, if you were on the run from the law, you could show up at Diana's temple and the safe zone was one bow shot away from the roof line. Any, anything inside that circle, you could not be arrested. You could not be held accountable. And so criminals from all over the Roman world would make their way there and find refuge at Diana's tree of life, a safe haven. That's just an interesting parallel for us criminals against God. Not unrepentant ones, but repentant criminals. We find refuge in Christ, unassailable by the Roman Empire. All of this imagery would have been readily apparent to the ones who read this letter. How did they respond? Church history tells us that Ephesus repented collectively as a church and they functioned as a witness for Christ for at least another generation. But if you go there today, there is no church at Ephesus. It is entirely Islamic and there is nearly zero witness for Christ there. The lampstand has been removed. At some point, the church faded. What does this mean for us? Well, if we take our cues from this letter, we, we can't be content with doctrinal error. We cannot get comfortable with moral compromise. We must not be naive about false teachers within the church. The church will be undone if it loses out to false teaching or if holiness is replaced by immorality. But the message to the church at Ephesus is this. The correction is this. Doctrinal precision, moral rectitude, and heresy hunting do not themselves define the health of a church. And so we must maintain the fire of love for Christ. We cannot let the machinery of doing church overrun the primacy of love. It's much easier for the church to do programs than it is to maintain fervent love. Love for Christ, love for one another, love for the lost. As a church, as individuals, we must continually cultivate this deep, affectionate love for Christ who loved us and gave himself up for us. What would Jesus say of your life? What would Jesus say of your heart, Christian? And what might Jesus say about Grace Bible Church? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for these words. They comfort and they cut. They probe they reveal, oh God, would you unearth in each one of us corners and recesses where we are not filled with love for you. Where we have lost the scent of our rescue. We have lost the memory of our redemption where we have walked away from a, a honeymoon absorption with all things Jesus. Would you help us everywhere that we need it to remember, to repent, and to return? We ask, O oh God, that this church would remain a lampstand useful to you, a platform for the light of the only hope that the world has, the gospel of your Son. May it be as far as it depends on us, we do not walk from these things. In Jesus' name, amen.